Hello, and thank you for joining How to Sort Through a Jungle of Pet Foods with Cassie Panning. I'm Maria Nellison, Certification Coordinator for the MVMA, and I am pleased to be your moderator today. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the Q&A area. I would like to introduce Cassie Panning. Cassie has been a CVT for over 16 years. She earned her associate degree in veterinary technology at Argosy University in 2004. She has worked in a variety of settings, including small animal internal medicine, general practice, and toxicology. Cassie also spent six years teaching at Minnesota School of Business, where she was able to take classes and earned her BS in veterinary technology management. She has always had a strong interest and passion for nutrition. In June of 2019, she passed her nutrition specialty exam and is now a veterinary technician specialist with the Academy of Veterinary Nutrition Technicians. Thanks again for joining us, Cassie. So welcome guys, hopefully you can hear me okay there. Today we're gonna talk through kind of how to pick a pet food and really just sorting through the jungle of pet foods that are available out there on the market today. So what we're gonna talk about here, let's see if my slides will advance. Oh, let me back up. So what we're gonna talk about is really kind of where should we find our reliable sources of information? We know that there's just a ton of nutrition available out there on the internet and from other people. And really, how do we sort through and find out what are the quality sources of information? We'll talk about how to select a pet food company. And once you're comfortable selecting a pet food company, that will give you kind of the tools to be able to pick a specific product within that pet food company's line. We're gonna to briefly touch on reading pet food labels. That of course could be a whole course in itself because there's a lot of little nuances that go into reading pet food labels with all of the rules and regulations, but we'll briefly touch on that so you can be a little bit more comfortable. We'll also show you how to kind of compare the foods that are on the market so that once you're reading that pet food label, you're able to really look at the foods and compare them on a similar basis versus trying to compare apples to oranges. And then we'll do a little bit of a case study here where we can tie all of the things that we talk about today together so that hopefully you have a little bit more comfort in making that pet food recommendation. So when we talk about looking at pet foods, we kind of back up and where do we even begin? If you haven't been to a pet food recently, which right now you probably haven't with our current regulations, but if you haven't been to a pet food retailer just within the recent years, you've seen that there's maybe just this jungle of foods out there. As a pet owner, when they walk into even a grocery store, there's a large variety of foods to select from, and it can be very confusing with the marketing and with what the sales associates tell you or what's listed on the package of how do you choose the best food for your pet. So again, it's just, it's a large assortment out there and it's tough to even kind of think about where should we begin when picking a pet food for our pets or to recommend to our clients. So just a few kind of just quick pet food fast facts here, just to give you an idea of what the market's looking like. Currently, there's roughly 5,000 brands on the market, and that seems to continue to grow. Everybody wants to kind of jump into the pet food market. They have the new best kind of food or ideas of what's best for our pets out there. And people are, you know, just continuing to create products. We have celebrities making pet food lines. We have people with marketing degrees making pet food lines. There's pet parents that are just really passionate about pet foods coming out with their own products. So as you can see, it just continues to grow. Within those 5,000 brands, there's currently roughly 211 different pet food manufacturers, meaning that that's the places where the pet food is actually made and then sent to store. So you can see that of those 5,000 brands that are out on the market, they're manufactured, a lot of them probably at the same plants, because there's not that many different manufacturers to represent all of the brands that are currently on the market. One of the reasons that we tend to see a lot of people jumping into the kind of the pet food game or the pet food sales is it's a billion dollar a year industry. And when you start talking numbers in the billions, of course, people want to have kind of a cut of that pie or add some of that to their profits. So in 2018, they did $91 million in pet food sales. And that number continues to grow as people want, again, what's the best for their pets. So we look at kind of where do we get our quality information? So if you think about some of the sources that you might currently use or that your clients might currently use, 
you kind of want to look at are they quality and reputable sources. A lot of people like to use the website Dog Food Advisor, and of course, from a client's perspective, it looks like a great website. It says right on their home page, expert opinion, trusted advice. We help you choose the best food for your dog. That, of course, seems like a quality source of information, but is it really? We need to kind of look at what the credentials for some of these are. We also have articles and references that people write in Whole Dog Journal that, again, might just be a passionate pet owner or somebody who has just a drive for nutrition and not necessarily the credentials to back that up. We see many people turn to Google because Google has become kind of our source of all information. So you can do a quick Google search on your favorite pet food and you might find a lot of information, reviews, things that people say about that pet food. Oftentimes one of the first things that pops up if you punch a pet food into a Google search is whether or not it was recalled and there's different types of recalls. So that may or may not be good information that they're finding. Some of your clients just go to the pet food store employees and talk with them. Again, they expute a lot of confidence in their recommendations to our clients when they're in the store. It's not necessarily always correct information, but they're there on the front line helping your client get that bag of food into their cart. Some clients are really tied to the information their breeder gives them. Again, some of that information might be good quality information. Some might be old information and some might just be more anecdotal or passionate information that's passed on. We also see a lot of information given to us via TV commercials and marketing about how our pets may be our wolves or how they need to eat an all meat diet. So there's just lots of information that's thrown at our clients out there. And then hopefully some of our information is coming from our veterinary professionals and that we can have that confidence and competence to really be able to give that information to our clients the correct information and be their source of information when it comes to picking a pet food for their pet. So some of the more reliable sources that I like to use and to pass on to my clients because the information comes from, from professionals that have credentials that really have the knowledge and have studied this information. So one of those resources is the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And they're a global committee and they have resources for more than just pet food uh, nutrition, they have kind of recommendations on a variety of things, but they do have this nice resource put together that's called the Nutrition Toolkit. And within that toolkit, there's a lot of different handouts and information that you can easily print out and hand to your clients or send them links in their discharges if that's something you send clients home with, or reference them in like a blog article, or again, it's just great information for you to look through yourself to really kind of find out how to make the best recommendations when it comes to pet food. One of the handouts that I like to use from their toolkit are the Savvy Cat Owner and Savvy Dog Owner's Guide to Nutrition on the Internet. Because again, we use the internet for just about everything these days when we're wanting to look up at least quick or fast information. And these handouts just give you and your clients a little bit more information on digging into the content of that website so that you're able to really look at who wrote this article, what are their credentials, what are their goals and why did they write this information so that you can have that little bit better understanding of, is it just a pet owner or a person out there that's really passionate about pet food or is it somebody that's actually studied nutrition and the animals that's providing that information? Another great website that has just a lot of information on it that you can kind of look through can help you with making a diet recommendation, just a ton of great resources on their website is the Pet Nutrition Alliance. And they're again, a group that was uh, put together. They have a lot of information that they provide on obtaining a diet history. They have a calculator for helping you with calories, especially for pets that need weight loss. And then we'll talk a little bit more about their Dare to Ask project here too, when we talk about how to pick a pet food company. But again, that is a website that is just filled with lots of good, credible information. And then if you wanna get down to kind of the nitty gritty, scientific, more governing information for nutrition, you can turn to AFCO. And AFCO of course is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And they're kind of the ones that set the rules around pet food. They are not a governing body, or excuse me, they are not a regulatory body. And you'll hear me mention that a few times because people will throw around terms, especially now with picking a pet food about that it's a Wasaba approved product or it's an AFCO approved product and neither of those organizations approve foods. We'll talk a little bit more about their roles, but they don't actually go around and regulate pet food 
saying pet food A is great, so we're gonna put the AFCO stamp of approval on it. That's not something that they do. They just set all of the rules and regulations about what sort of nutrient profiles need to be in that food for that species, what you can and can't say on the label, and again, more of the regulations, not really an enforcement agency. So one of the other handouts here that's in that Wasava Nutrition Toolkit is this kind of how to select a pet food. And it's a great handout that again, you can hand this out to your clients. It goes through some checkpoints on there. I know you probably can't read it here on your screen, but if you go to their Nutrition Toolkit and pull it up, it's an easy handout to print out and either again, give to your clients or send them the links to. But it kind of goes through some of the criteria to check off when you're looking at a pet food company and determining whether or not they meet your criteria based on, again, a number of little different check boxes. And of course, your criteria for a pet food company doesn't have to have each and every one of these pieces, but you can choose which ones you think are most important. Personally, I like to see companies meet most, if not all of these criteria, if I'm going to recommend them. So some of those things that we look at are, does this company employ a full-time qualified nutritionist? Meaning, do they have somebody on staff full-time that's formulating their diets, that's overseeing kind of the nutrient analysis for that, somebody that's really studied animal nutrition and knows what these pets need? And again, having them work for the company full-time really just gives them that little bit more of accountability versus a company that maybe contracts with a nutritionist. The other thing we like to ask these companies when we're kind of checking into them just to see is who's formulating your recipes and what are their credentials? So is the person that's putting together this pet food formulation, which there's a lot of detail into formulation, looking at what are the needs of that species? What are the needs of that specific life stage for the pet? What are the nutrient to nutrient interactions to ensure that the final product meets what the pet really needs to thrive? So we want to know who's doing that formulating for the company and again, what are their credentials? Preferably, it's somebody that studied the species that they're formulating for. So for example, you may or may not want somebody who studied bovine nutrition formulating your dog and cat food. Maybe you're okay with that, but maybe you would prefer somebody who has a PhD in small animal or dog and cat nutrition versus somebody who maybe again has a PhD in bovine nutrition. Does the company own their own manufacturing plant? Again, as we kind of looked at with the fast facts, there's not a manufacturing plant for every brand of product out on the market. So many of them are co-packed. And when you're looking at a co-packed product, it's a company that either has a nutritionist or contracts with a nutritionist to create a formulation. And once they have essentially that recipe, they send it to a co-packing manufacturing plant and that plant may or may not produce like three or four different products all in the same day, and they just punch in the recipe for the ingredients. So when the companies don't own their own manufacturing plants, we don't always see the high level of quality control. They don't always have the control over the specific ingredients that go into that product or the quality of the ingredients. If the recipe says corn, the company is gonna put corn in, but it might not meet the nutrient specs that that company is looking for which that kind of ties in with what sort of quality control measures does that company use? Are they testing the products before they ever even go into the plant for manufacturing? A lot of our quality pet food companies, they have a lot of standard quality control measures in place to where if the truck of ingredients shows up and the seal on that truck is broken, they're gonna turn it away. Or if the product shows up and they do a quick analysis of the ingredient and it's not meeting their specific quality control or their nutrient specs that they want that product to meet, they will also turn that away. And companies that have these kind of higher quality control measures are sometimes where we end up seeing those back orders on certain flavors of product. For example, some of the more exotic ingredient products sometimes will go on a back order, such as like venison, because the companies that are using that ingredient, they have a specific spec that they want that venison meat to meet. And if it doesn't meet that, then they send it away, even if it means they have to put that product on back order. So it's not that they do back orders because they want to, it's because they won't compromise the quality of the product that they're putting into their pet food. We also like to look at companies that will provide us with a full nutrient analysis for their formulas. 
And that's not saying that I want the company to send me their quote recipe for the food so that I can take it and go to my own manufacturing plant and then turn it into my own pet food. But I want them to be able to tell me that they know exactly what's in their food, that they have enough quality control over the ingredients and the nutrient profile that they can give me that information. We also look for companies that do peer reviewed research. Are they moving the veterinary profession and the field of nutrition forward? Pet food companies and kind of the guidelines or the rules and regulations for the nutrient profiles for food have changed a lot over the years. And one of those that's a little bit more recent is the labeling of large breed puppy food. And that's because they found in their research here that really large breed growing puppies have a different nutritional need than our smaller breed dogs. And because somebody did that research, had it peer reviewed and published, we were able to change the nutrient profiles and kind of the requirements for them. And then kind of the last one that we look for are companies that use AFCO feeding trials. And this means that they went and they followed the rules and regulations set forth by AFCO to do a feeding trial to say that their formula not only looks good on paper and meets all of their specs for what it needs for that life stage and species, but they actually took that product and fed it to animals to make sure that it, what went in was really what was on the paper, meaning that it was digestible enough the animals were able to use the nutrients, that there didn't end up being nutrient-nutrient interactions to where you weren't actually getting the, the nutrients that you thought were in that product into the animal. So when we're looking at some of those criteria in choosing a pet food company, it can be a little bit challenging because I will tell you that information is oftentimes not readily available. It's not something that's often on the package. You can find out whether or not they've done uh, AFCO feeding trials on the package via their nutritional adequacy statement. But really, if you're looking for this information, you're not going to go to company B's website and look for their information on who formulates their recipes and whether or not they own their own manufacturing plant. Some companies have some of that information on their websites, but really it's not reliable to necessarily just say, I'm going to research this new pet food company by only going to their website and finding this information. So really, if you want to go through that full checklist of criteria for a company, you usually need to call them. And that can sometimes be a little bit frustrating because oftentimes the first person you get on the phone is a customer service agent, and they may or may not have that information. And they may have to send you kind of up the chain of command to somebody that can answer those questions. And some of the companies get actually pretty frustrated when you call them and ask them these questions to where they get kind of defensive towards you or they don't even want to talk to you. So one of the tools that the Pet Nutrition Alliance put together to really help you guys out when picking a pet food is they did that grunt work for you. They went through and they called all of the pet food companies out there and they asked them not all of the Wasava kind of questions on there because of course that would take an just a large amount of time to get through all of those questions with every company. So they select kind of what they thought were some of the more important ones to see if they could sort out the information from these companies for you. And so on the Pet Nutrition Alliance website, they have their dare to ask. And from that, you can get into what looks like this little screenshot from below and kind of look at all of the products. You're able to search by the brand name of your product, some of that will show up and you can see that that product is owned by a different company and that it's just manufactured or sold under that name. So that will show up in that kind of brand name section there for you. One of the things that they looked at or asked these companies is, is a contract manufacturer used to make your pet food? So essentially, do you own your own manufacturing plant? So if the answer is yes, then that means that that company does not own their plant. If their answer is no, that means that, nope, they don't use a contract manufacturer and they own their own pet food manufacturing plant. They also looked at who's formulating the food. So they would have asked, you know, who's formulating your recipes and what are their credentials? So they looked at, you know, is a nutritional expert used? And you can see here for some of them, like the first one there consults with a nutritionist that has a PhD in animal nutrition. So that person is not employed full time at that company they essentially hire somebody on in the short term, create their recipes, they talk about what they're looking for in their new pet food, and then that recipe becomes theirs, but that nutritionist doesn't work for the company full time. They looked at what percent of the manufacturing plant um, is owned by them. So do they 
do some in-house manufacturing at their own plant and do they co-pack some of their food? So the ones that are shown here, they own 100% of their own manufacturing plants. And then they were asked to provide just a random nutrient amount. So they might have been asked how much sodium is in XYZ product that you manufacture. And either the company was willing to provide that information or at least get back to them if they didn't have it at the ready. Or as you go through, if you look at this full report, you'll see that there were a number of companies that declined to answer that information. They did not want to provide that information to the Pet Nutrition Alliance during this project. So they will continue to update that and contact these companies for you. Again, it doesn't go through all the checklist, but it does give you kind of a good starting point so that you can have some of that information without having to call these companies. So does this leave us with a lack of products? If we go to that kind of Wasava guideline and we're looking for companies that meet all of those kind of criteria, does that leave us with only three or four products to pick from? And the answer of course is no. Within the companies that are going to kind of follow those Wasava guidelines, again, it's not a Wasava approval, it's a Wasava kind of guideline or checklist, there's still ample products to pick from. You would still have hundreds of products within a number of manufacturers to be able to find that specific product that's going to meet all of your pet's needs or again, your client's pet's needs. So we'll talk now a little bit about labeling. And again, AFCO, the Association of American Speed Control Officials are the ones that set the rule on what can be on the pet food label, how things have to be listed on the pet food label. Again, I will state that they are not a regulatory body. There is not such a thing as an AFCO approved diet. There will be an AFCO nutritional adequacy statement on all products that are sold, but that doesn't mean that AFCO looked at that formula that they say, yep, it fit all of the criteria that we set forth. Your label looks great. You can now sell this food. That's not a thing that happens. They set the rules and kind of within the pet food company, the companies kind of self-regulate. So if a new company comes on the market and they're making all sorts of claims about their product and maybe slandering some of the other products, I will promise you that most of those companies that are being slandered are gonna look a little bit harder at the new company. And if they're seeing infractions or things that they're doing wrong, they're going to report those to the regulatory bodies. But that's not something AFCO does. They do not approve products. They set the rules and regulations. So what they say has to be on a pet food label, and again, this is a brief overview because the AFCO manual is quite a thick book and there is a lot of rules and regulations to look through, but you have to have the product and brand name. You must list the species of intent or make it clear that if it's cat food, it is clearly labeled as cat food. If it's dog food, it's clearly labeled as dog food. A quantity statement, so it needs to say on the package that it's a 13 ounce can. It needs to say that it's a 16.7 pound bag something that tells you how much product is in that container. They must have a guaranteed analysis on there. They also must list an ingredient statement and we'll talk both about guaranteed analysis and ingredients here a little bit more in detail, but there's a lot of things that can and can't be included with those pieces. To me, one of the most important pieces of information that's on a pet food label is the nutritional adequacy statement because it gives you a lot of information must list feeding directions for that product and the name and address of the manufacturer or distributor so that if you have questions or concerns it's readily available on your package who to contact with those questions or concerns so that would be information you could use if you wanted to call that company and kind of go through or ask them all of those wasava criteria questions so as again, we're looking at the label of a product, we look at the product and we want to take a look at the guaranteed analysis. So when we look at the guaranteed analysis, AFCO again sets rules of what can be listed, how they have to be listed, so on and so forth. What they say has to be part of the guaranteed analysis is the minimum percentage of crude protein. So you can see on this label over here to the right that the minimum amount of crude protein in this specific product is 28%. Now, of course, there's rules and guidelines on, depending on the species and the life stage that this product is intended for, what that percentage has to fall within, but it has to be represented as a minimum amount of crude protein. They also must list the minimum percentage of crude fat. So again, in this product, it's 18% minimum crude fat. They must list the maximum percentage of crude fiber and the maximum percentage of moisture, noting that again, there are 
uh, set parameters for those. So moisture, for example, has to be within a certain percentage if it's a dry food, and it has to be within a certain percentage if it's a canned food. And of course, they have kind of their set guidelines. You can see on the label here over to the right that there are additional pieces of information listed in the guaranteed analysis. Those are not required to be there. The manufacturer only has to list these four pieces of information in their guaranteed analysis. If a company chooses to list additional products, then of course they have to list them in the manner that the AFCO states. So again, certain ingredients or nutrients that they list there have to be listed either as minimums or maximums. And there's a specific order then that those must be listed following the four required components of a guaranteed analysis. But keeping in mind that the rest of that does not have to be there. So it's not always easy to go to a product and find out what the sodium content is because sodium, for example, is not required to be on the guaranteed analysis. They also have to list the ingredients. And the thing that gets a little bit confusing or tricky with the ingredient list is that they're listed in order of weight not necessarily amount. If you look at a wet ingredient versus a dry ingredient, it's, you have to take into account the water weight. So it's not always that the first ingredient is the most. You have to become a little bit wise to what those ingredient terms mean and how that can be kind of changed around or ingredients can be listed so that it looks like chicken is the first ingredient. But again, when we see the term chicken, that's chicken with the water weight still in the chicken, which of course is gonna weigh more than whole grain wheat. So it's not necessarily that chicken's not present in the most weight quantity. It might not be present though in the most amount quantity. The other thing that gets a little kind of tricky or annoying here with the ingredient statements is you have to use the AFCO established terms. Some of those terms were created years and years ago and they've never been really upgraded or changed. So people don't always know what they mean, like byproduct. It's a term that sounds horrible, but we'll talk a little bit more about what some of those ingredient definitions are so that you have a little better understanding of why they're listed that way. You also see some of the ingredients listed on there that look like they're chemicals, but typically those are your vitamins and minerals because they use the actual name of the vitamin or mineral. You also can't provide any sort of free range chicken can't be listed. You can't list those additional descriptive terms with your ingredient list. So there's no way to determine what type of chicken is used in the product. Just it falls under the ingredient chicken. So we'll talk a little bit more here about nutritional adequacy statements, because again, I think they're really a, an important part of that label that most people overlook or don't read or really don't even know that it's there. I think it provides you know, a lot of information that can be very useful when you're selecting a pet food for your own pets or even for making a recommendation for a client. So again, it's something that must be on the label unless the product is clearly labeled as a treat or snack. Many treats will still have AFCO nutritional adequacy statements on them and will list things like for supplemental or intermittent feeding only. But if it's a product that is clearly labeled as a food or meant to be the sole source of nutrition for that pet, it has to have a nutritional adequacy statement on it. AFCO has four recognized life stages, meaning that again, when you look at the rules and regulations throughout the AFCO manual, there will be certain nutrient specs that a product must meet to be labeled as a product for gestation or lactation. They have a life stage for growth, which again, as we briefly mentioned, there's now separate language for large and giant breed dogs, in their growth phase, and that's relatively new. There's a life stage for maintenance, and then there's kind of their catch-all, which is all life stages. If a product is labeled for all life stages, it must meet the life stage with the highest demand. So in this case of these three, it's going to have to meet the requirements for gestation and lactation, as that's when our pets are going to have their highest nutrient needs. The one that's not on here that a lot of people think is a life stage, but it's not, is senior. Senior is not a recognized AFCO life stage, so there is not specific nutrient requirements that have to be in a food to be labeled as senior. Typically, those will have an AFCO adequacy statement for maintenance. The other piece of information that your nutritional adequacy statement will give you is whether or not the food was formulated or if it's undergone those AFCO feeding trials. So that's where I say these statements provide a lot of information for you just in reading them. 
When we look at them, AFCO says you must list your nutritional adequacy statement verbatim from what they have listed as kind of their samples. Now, of course, again, because AFCO is not a regulatory body, there's a little bit of wiggle room here if companies are trying to make it more clear as to who that product is intended for. And again, unless another company is gonna be out there reporting them for not listing it verbatim, there's not really a catch-all for that, but it, they really should look very similar to the ones here. So an example is Tasty Cat Food, which would be the name of the product, is formulated. So right there, we already know that this product has not undergone AFCO feeding trials. To meet the nutritional levels established by the AFCO cat food nutrient profile for all life stages. So this tells me that this is a cat food that would be appropriate to feed essentially to all cats, but it's going to have a nutrient profile that's designed to meet the needs of a cat that is either pregnant or has just had kittens. So for that gestation and lactation on there. A couple of the other ones you can see here. So another one would be super premium puppy food is again, formulated to meet the nutritional levels established by the AFCO dog food nutrient profile for growth, including growth of large sized dogs. So that's one of the newer terms here that AFCO added in. They used to just say growth, but if a dog food now has the claim for growth, it must state whether or not it's appropriate for large and giant breed puppies. AFCO sets that spec kind of at dogs that will be 70 pounds or more as an adult, I find it most appropriate to feed it to any dog that's going to be 50 pounds or more as an adult to look for that large breed. The one thing you have to be a little bit careful about with this specific uh, nutritional adequacy statement is sometimes the companies will write uh, for growth, or excuse me, for growth, excluding growth of large size dogs. So really be careful when you're looking for whether it's including or excluding the growth of large size dogs. And then the last one here is just one that has, uh, that lets us know that this product has undergone that AFCO feeding trial. So animal feeding tests using AFCO procedures substantiate that yummy cat food provides complete and balanced nutrition for cat maintenance. So this lets us know that they formulated the product, they went through all of the steps for an AFCO feeding trial, and that they found that this product is appropriate for a maintenance food for cats. So we'll just take a quick peek at a label here. So. Who is this product intended for? Well, if we take a look at the label, there's obviously the picture of an adult cat on there, and it does say adult seven plus. So this product should be intended for adult cats. Then we look at, does that AFCO nutritional adequacy statement match? Occasionally you'll find foods that are listed as adult senior or adult 12 plus, those sorts of things, but they have an all life stages nutritional adequacy statement. So they're really intended more for a gestation, lactation, or growth versus the maintenance of an adult animal. But if we look at the nutritional adequacy statement for this specific product here, Hill Science Diet Adult 7 Plus Chicken Recipe is formulated for the maintenance of adult cats. So yes, what's listed on the principal display panel here for the product, that's kind of what they call the front of the bag, is matches what the nutritional adequacy statement shows. So to find your nutritional adequacy statements, because they're usually printed in pretty small print, there's of course rules that are supposed to be followed for that. You should always find your nutritional adequacy statement on the panel immediately to the right from the principal display panel. So if we're looking at this bag in specific, this would be the type of bag that I would consider a four-sided bag because it usually has information on those side panels as compared to when you look at your large bags of dog food, they really have a front and a back. So on this product, it should be on that right side of the bag on that first panel. If this were a big bag of dog food, it should be on the back because that's the panel immediately to the right of the principal display panel. So that should help you hopefully find them. But again, not all companies follow that rule. So sometimes you have to do a little hunting for it. So then we'll look at our ingredients. So this is just a random ingredient list from a pet food that I pulled. And when we look at it, which ingredient are you guys thinking just at kind of first glance is present in the largest quantity? So if we back up again and talk about how ingredients are listed, they're listed by weight. And knowing again what the definitions are for how the ingredients are listed can really kind of help you look at that. The other thing that happens with our ingredient lists 
is companies will use what's called split label ingredient listing. So they will take some ingredients and they will split them down into kind of their more specific names. And by doing so, they sometimes can list those ingredients in two, three, four different spots when really it's kind of the same ingredient, but they just broke it down into a more of a scientific or more of a specific name for that ingredient. So when we're kind of glancing over this list, we're seeing a number of different ingredients here. The other thing to know about how ingredients are listed is that really if the first three or two, three or four ingredients are present in the same weight quantity, the company or formulator can choose which order those ingredients get listed in. So there's all sorts of kind of, I guess, loopholes you could call them to how ingredients have to be listed. And formulators know these kind of regulations and how they can get away with floating ingredients to the top of the list while they're pushing other ingredients down. And that doesn't mean they're cheating the system, that they're not putting in what they say on the label, but they know how to list things or how to add them in in their specific names or order so that the label can appear that different ingredients are a little bit more towards the top than what they might be. So for this product, we, again, we take a look and is duck the present in the largest quantity or is it maybe peas? So we do have our first two ingredients are deboned duck, which again means that it's duck, but it still has the water weight added. So once we take out that water weight, that amount of duck meat might be a lot less in its weight and volume. Duck meal, however, is going to be in a higher uh, amount because it's the dehydrated portion. Meal means we removed the water weight from that product. So maybe duck is in a pretty good quantity, but as we're reading, we then have pea protein concentrate as our third ingredient, peas as our fifth ingredient, and pea fiber down as our seventh ingredient in there. So we took peas and we split it into like three different turns so we could list it in three different spots. If we added the full weight of those together, it probably would float P up to more the front of the list because again, it's all based on weight and not quantity. So keeping in mind again, how much does a whole duck weigh versus how much do peas weigh? When you look at then kind of the quantity of how much those products are present on this ingredient list. The thing to look at though, when we're looking at ingredients, and there's been a lot of marketing directing pet owners, you know, read your ingredient list, here's what to look for. And that's where some of those, again, kind of loopholes, if you wanna call them that, came about to float ingredients throughout the list to put them where the manufacturer wants them. But the thing we have to remember is that our pets don't need ingredients. They need nutrients. Dogs don't need duck. Cats don't need duck. They don't need peas, but they need the nutrients that those ingredients provide. And so when you're seeing things listed on an ingredient label and you think, huh, I want that added for, it's to provide a specific nutrient. And again, that's where formulators and veterinary nutritionists know what the nutrient profile of that ingredient is and what it's going to provide in the food. It's also going to look at hopefully kind of those nutrient nutrient interactions. So they know how much needs to go in to ensure that we have that the amount we want in our final product. We also can see some of the vitamins and minerals be destroyed in the cooking process. So again, we need to know, or the formulators need to know how much of that ingredient needs to go in to ensure I have adequate levels of choline in my final product. So remember that we don't need specific ingredients for our pets, our pets need nutrients. So we'll look just at a few of the AFCO established definitions here so that you can get a little bit better idea of why those ingredients are there. Again, you'll hear clients use, you'll hear marketers use the term fillers and that these pet food companies are putting things in their products that don't provide any nutrition and they're just there as a filler. I will tell you there aren't companies out there that put fillers in their product because a filler definition would be something that does not provide any nutrients to our pets that ingredient is still going to cost that company money. So if it's really not doing anything, a company is not going to spend money to put that ingredient in their product because then they're gonna make less profit on that product if it's not doing something specific as far as being either an ingredient that's gonna help kibble hold its shape or it's going to provide a, 
or excuse me, provide a very specific nutrient for that pet. They're not going to just add things to add things to the product. So again, some of the definitions or some of the ingredient terms you might see on your pet food label is whole grain corn. And I put that at the top of the list because corn gets such a bad rap out there and everybody thinks it's this horrible ingredient that's again a filler in our pet food. And really when it says whole grain corn, that definition or that ingredient term is pretty straightforward. It's the whole kernel of corn. Corn can provide a sense of carbohydrate or energy. It provides um, some amino acids. So corn does have protein in it. It's not a complete amino acid profile. It provides a source of linoleic acid, which is an essential fatty acid for our pets and other vitamins and minerals. We look at brewer's rice. The term brewer's just means that it can be the broken grains of rice included in with the whole grains of rice. Again, it's a very digestible grain and it's gonna provide a source of energy. Chicken byproduct meal. Really, when again, when we see that term byproduct, it's the organ meat that we're looking at. It's not the pieces of like beaks and feathers that we're seeing in our products. Chicken byproduct meal is usually the organ meat and that's going to be your richest source of nutrients for your pets. It's gonna have much more vitamins and minerals than the actual chicken meat. When we see that term meal again, it just removes that the water weight has been removed and it's gonna provide again, a high quality source of protein. Animal fat, AFCO has specific terms of which animals, if it's just listed as animal that it can come from. So this would be the fat from pork, beef or poultry. And it's also gonna provide some essential fatty acids and energy. Fat has twice the energy of protein and carbohydrates. So it's gonna provide a source of calories for our pets. Beet pulp is going to be a fiber source that's going to be in the product. Really, that can help regulate GI motility, and it can also work as kind of an agent to help kibble keep its shape. So it is there for a reason. It is, again, not a filler. Fish oil is often added to diets so that we can have a rich source of EPA and DHA. Wheat gluten is a term that's used essentially when we make or take the portion of the wheat product that is the protein. So again, plant proteins are not a complete amino acid profile, but you can pair some of your plant-based proteins together to get that full amino acid profile. And again, it's a way to provide carbohydrates and protein. And then corn gluten meal, again, it's really the protein portion of the, of the whole kernel of corn. And being that it's a meal, we know that it's dehydrated or that the water part has been removed. So again, you can get all of those ingredient definitions in that AFCO manual, but they're also listed in a lot of your product guides. And we'll talk a little bit more here about product guides, but I know if for sure in the Purina product guide, they have a whole section in back that talks about ingredients and their definitions. So we're gonna quick look at how to compare products here so that again, we can look at them more on a nutrient basis so that we're able to turn and look at products more on an apples to apples product basis from that guaranteed analysis. So these are two products here that we're gonna compare. We have a blue life protection formula and a Purina Pro Plan product. And when we look at guaranteed analyses, it looks like maybe that the Pro Plan product is a little bit higher in protein and fat than the blue product. But we'll look at that on a nutrient basis so that we can really kind of compare them here on a same basis level. When we look at these products, I'm also going to look at their AFCO statements here to see if I'm even comparing similar products. Both of these products list that they are an adult product. So I look at their AFCO statements to see if that matches. If you look at your blue uh, nutritional adequacy statement, it does say that it's formulated for maintenance. If we look at the pro plan nutritional adequacy statement, it does list here that it's undergone AFCO feeding procedures, but that it's for all life stages, including large breed growth. So while these look like we might be comparing similar products on the label, it's really looking at an adult food potentially versus like a puppy food. So to break them down to a nutrient analysis, there's some numbers that have been researched when they looked at products to see what numbers should we add to that minimum amount of protein on the guaranteed analysis to really get them closer to their actual nutrient profiles. So this is again a little sheet here that'll talk about that. For protein, we add one and a half as that was kind of the number that was found to be on average for them. If you're looking at comparing fat levels, we're gonna add that 1% to the, again, the guaranteed analysis. 
It also then gives you kind of a comparison here so you can look at whether or not your food falls into being a low protein, moderate protein, or high protein diet. So you can kind of see the steps that they walk through here, but I will show you that when we look at these products. So if we take a look at the two products, we look at our product one that has a guaranteed analysis crude protein level of 24% minimum. We add that 1.5 to it to give us 25.5. The second step was to take the caloric density, which is that number that's labeled as kcals per kilogram, divide it by 10,000 to give us a number of 0 0.3613. We then take that percentage and divide it by that caloric density, and it tells me that that product has 70.57 grams of protein then per 1,000 calories. I like to look at products on a 100-calorie basis. It just kind of depends on how your mind works. So I break mine down then to being 7.05 grams of protein per 100 calories. We compare that to product two that had the higher protein on the guaranteed analysis, that 26% protein plus our 1.5 kind of our add-on factor to give me 27.5. I again take my caloric density of the product, divide it by 10,000. My percentage divided by my new caloric density number gives me 68.8 grams of protein per thousand calories or 6.88 grams of protein per hundred calories. So when we look at these food foods, because their nutrient densities or that kcal per kilogram amount was different and our guaranteed analysis is as a percentage, you can see that even though the Purina product appeared to have more protein based on the guaranteed analysis, Really, when we look, break it down on a nutrient level, the Blue Buffalo product has a little bit more protein in there. And again, that's an average to just help you compare them more on a similar basis. The easier way to do that is if you're using a product that, again, has a product guide. They have lots of useful information in these books here, and you can get them from your company product reps, but they will give you all of that information. So instead of doing the math for the ProPlan product, I could have just come to my product guide here to look at my chart and see that under protein, it lists that it actually has about 7.04 grams per 100 calories. And that's not because we did the math wrong, that's because that's just an average factor that we add. And instead, the company provides you with this information when they've really done an analysis of the product. So it's gonna be a little bit more accurate to use your product guides for products when you have them available versus doing that, breaking down the guaranteed analysis to a nutrient basis. So let's put it all together here quick uh, by doing a quick case study here. So this is Squeak. Squeak is a 12-year-old female spade German short hair pointer who's presenting today just for an annual health check. And her owner just wants to make sure that her diet is still meeting her needs. On exam today, she weighed 28 kilograms or 61.6 pounds. In the world of nutrition, I like to have their weight available in both because I use both of those numbers when doing my uh, kind of overview or assessment of my patient and when I'm determining where I need to go. So how do we even begin to figure out what Squeak needs and whether or not her current diet is meeting her needs? So hopefully we're gonna start again by doing that initial assessment, which we did based on her numbers there. So we're gonna do a body condition score. Hopefully you're all familiar and comfortable with doing those. I like to use the nine point scale because that's the one that has actually been validated. Muscle condition scoring might be something that's new to you, and I'll give you some resources here for that. I always like to calculate out what their estimated healthy lean body weight is so that we can use that in there where we need to go with their recommendation. So for pets that are underweight or overweight, we need to figure that out for them. If you're looking at the nine point scale, our ideal again is somewhere in that four and a five or four and a half to five out of nine. So if they're underweight, each number under that four is roughly 10% underweight. And for each number over that five, they're roughly 10% overweight. So that's how you can really kind of figure, it, figure out what their estimated healthy lean body weight is. And again, that's an estimate. We also need to figure out what their target calories are and what her target protein level is. So again, in that Wasava Nutrition Toolkit, you can get some body condition scores for both the dog and cat. You can also learn how to do muscle condition scoring. So again, if that's not something you're comfortable and familiar with, I recommend printing these sheets out and really becoming familiar with assessing whether or not our pets are losing their lean body mass. 
They also provide in that toolkit a diet history form. That's going to be the most accurate way to determine Squeak's individual needs is by knowing what she's eating because she's at a healthy lean body weight. So this really helps us kind of determine where the pet is starting, whether we need to make a change for her, and whether or not her current diet, again, is meeting her needs. So really getting that diet history is going to be the most important part here, and it really helps us maintain a healthy lean body weight for our pets. So I also, with a diet history, like to calculate out their kind of formulation energy requirements. So I like to calculate out a resting energy requirement and a daily energy requirement. Research has shown that dogs really to thrive need about a gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. And that's again where I like to have my body weight in both kilograms and pounds, specifically because I'm going to use the kilograms when I'm calculating out the RER and DER, but I need to know her weight in pounds so that I know how much protein she needs. So again, we know a healthy lean body weight is about four, four and a half to five out of nine. So I estimate Squeak's healthy lean body weight to be somewhere probably between 60 and 62 pounds meaning that at minimum i want to find a diet or ensure that her current diet is providing her with at least 62 grams of protein per day she is a senior dog now so our goal is to try to increase that protein as much as possible as our senior dogs have a little bit higher protein turnover sometimes though there are health concerns or underlying health conditions that may contraindicate that but we really want to try to strive for that 62 grams per day or higher so then we'll Calculate out her resting energy requirement. I like to use the exponential formula because it is a little bit more accurate. So that's Kig's uh, lean body weight in kilograms raised to the three quarter power times 70. So you can do that on a scientific calculator, which you usually have on your phone if that's with you. So Kig's raised to the three quarter power times 70 for Squeak would give us 852 calories. Or if you're using a calculator as pictured here, you first cube her kilograms, so 28 times 28 times 28, then hit that square root button twice, and times it by 70 will give you the same number, that 852 calories for her resting energy requirement. We then need to take that and times it by her life stage factor to get her daily energy requirement. You can use this as your formula if you're unable to obtain a diet history, but again, preference is to really get that thorough and accurate diet history. These are the life stage factors that we look at. Squeak is an average neutered adult. You could also use your overweight prone or inactive factors depending on uh, if you know how active she is. So I take my resting energy requirement of the 852 calories times I just chose a life stage factor here of neutered adult. Uh, so times 1.6, which says math or a formula predicts on average squeak needs about 1,363 calories a day and a minimum of 62 grams of protein. I like to do that calculation even when I get a diet history, just so I can see if my pet is eating a lot more calories than what's predicted or a lot less calories than what's predicted. That can give you some insight into some metabolic changes that might be happening with them. So then we get her diet history and we take a look at her food. She's getting one and a half cups twice daily of the Purina One Smart Blend, Smart Blend Lamb and Rice Formula. She really doesn't get any treats and sometimes she gets some shares of some human food. So we can have all of the information here with her guaranteed analysis. Her food's 380 calories per cup. And we see that this food has undergone AFCO feeding trials. So first we're gonna look protein assessment of here. So again, we're going to go back to our little formula, take our 26% plus that one and a half, which is going to give us 27.5. Then we will take again that caloric density or the kcal per kilogram and divide it by 10,000, which is going to tell us that this food is roughly 6.9 grams of protein per 100 calories, because again, that's the language I speak. You can absolutely keep it at the 69 grams of protein per 1,000 calories. We then look at her calories. She's eating three cups of food per day. So she's actually only eating about 1,100 calories, maybe a little less than that math formula predicted for her, which is fine. That's what we know is her individual need. I will use that 1,100 number going forward and not the number I got by calculating out the formula. So we take her total calories times our protein concentration. And again, that's gonna be the protein concentration per 100 calories. So when I kind of mathematically multiply and divide that out, this tells me that Squeak's diet is currently providing her with 
78 to 79 grams of protein total per day. Again, we can pop into our feeding guide to get that information and skip some of that math, but if you don't have your product guide, you can absolutely do out the math formula. So Squeak's current diet is providing her with 78 to 79 grams of protein per day. Is that enough for her? Well, if we look back again, she was 61.6 or roughly 62 pounds or 62 grams of protein is what we wanted for her. So yes, it absolutely is providing her more and it's even exceeding her minimum, which is great for her being a little bit more of a senior dog. Then we look at the AFCO statement and does that meet her individual needs? So again, the AFCO statement's here for you at the bottom, saying that AFCO feeding procedures substantiate that the Purina One Smart Blend formula provides complete and balanced nutrition for maintenance of adult dogs, which is exactly what we would want in her case. Because again, if you remember, AFCO does not have a senior profile. So then we take a look at the product that she's eating. It's meeting her needs, but does it meet our criteria for a product or does the company meet our criteria for being a, you know, a pet food company we would recommend? So again, you can call the company or you can pop over to the Pet Nutrition Alliance Dare to Ask page and find the Nestle Purina Company. Essentially, do they own their own manufacturing plant? Yes, because they don't use a contract manufacturer. They have full-time uh, PhD nutritionists. They also have multiple full-time diplomats of the American College of Veterinary Nutritionists or essentially board certified veterinary nutritionists. So they kind of have a fleet of people that uh, formulate their diets. They own 100% of their manufacturing plant and they did provide nutrient information. So this would be a product that I would recommend. So we're gonna make the recommendation. We always want to make sure that we have the exact name of the that we're recommending. In many well pet cases, there's often multiple options that will meet their needs, but you wanna make sure that you give specific names. We always want easily measurable, specific amounts of food to feed. Frequency, you can always just write something like divided into meals or fed twice daily. There's not a huge need to feed pets multiple times a day, but again, most pets eat twice a day, that's pretty common. And then we always wanna have a follow-up plan, especially if we're making a diet change, we really wanna make sure that that diet is still meeting her needs and that we're not causing unintentional weight gain or weight loss. So in Squeak's case here, I would recommend Purina One Smart Blend Lamb and Rice. For my own personal reference, I always like to include the calories per cup or can for easy reference. Feed three cups total per day, divided into meals, or you could write feed one and a half cups twice a day. And then I'm gonna recommend to recheck her body weight again in two to four weeks, just to make sure that the information that was provided in her diet history was accurate, and that we're again, not causing unintentional weight gain or weight loss. For most pets, you do need to make sure you're including a treat plan because most pet owners are going to give treats. We wanna make sure that that's not making up more than five to 10% of their total daily intake, or in Squeak's case here, no more than 60 to 100 calories per day keeping in mind that we would then need to subtract her total food volume so that we're not increasing her total intake. So what we kind of talked about here today, just to kind of wrap up, is how to find some reliable sources of information out there regarding pet nutrition, how to select a pet food company, some of the criteria you might want to look at, briefly touched on how to read pet food labels, again, so you know some of the information that's on there and what to look for, you should now be able to kind of compare some of those various foods that are available on the market. And then we put it all together by looking at Squeak and whether or not her current diet was meeting her needs. This is just another kind of list here of some helpful nutrition resources that are available to you. I will tell you right now, a couple of these websites are down. They are doing some work on them, but the, eventually the links for these websites should all work for you. And again, that's where you're gonna find on the Pet Nutrition Alliance's website that Dare to Ask, as well as a lot of other helpful resources. And the Wasava website is where you're gonna find that nutrition toolkit, which can provide, again, all of those handouts that we looked at throughout the presentation. And with that, I'm not sure if we have time for questions at all or not. I will let Maria chime in here and let me know if there are any. Otherwise, I will be happy. If you wanna email them over, we can also follow up with them and send out kind of a mass answer to them. Thank you, Cassie. Um, a reminder, if you do have questions, so please type them in the Q&A area. Um, I will give you just a minute or so 
Um, and we do have a lot of questions for you, Cassie. So um, what I think we're going to do is, um, again, try and get your questions in now. If you run out of time or you think of something after um, this is this is over and closed, you can certainly please email them to me at Maria, uh, M-A-R-I-A, N is in uh, Nancy, at mvma.org. So Maria N at mvma.org. So again, um, I will ask kind of just a couple questions that came across. And again, what we'll do probably with the rest of the questions is we will type them all out. We'll get Cassie's answer on them and we will email them to your email account. So you have access to all of the answers, um, all the questions that were asked and all the answers for those questions. So, um, Cassie, one of the um, clarifications I think that someone was asking is um, at cats um, that they're classified as adults um, at age one year. Is that correct? I apologize. Uh, is who classified at, as cats. an adult at cats? Yes. So, when we're looking at growth formulas, of course, we can't always say exactly when pets are done growing. Um, Really, the only way to know would be to do radiographs when we think they're done growing, see if those growth plates are grow are closed. But really, we say that cats and small dogs really should have a growth formula until at least a year of age. That's kind of when we know they've matured. And then your large breed dogs, there's often now recommendations to continue a growth formula for them until they're maybe 18 months to two years of age to really ensure that they're getting all of that nutrition that is needed during that demanding time on their body. But in short, yes, cats should feed a growth or kitten food until they are a year of age. Okay, thanks, Cassie. Um, just one more question is on raw diet. Somebody wanted to know kind of what your thoughts are on the raw diets and that they do have um, a lot of clients that want to uh, make their own diets at home. I'm wondering if you have a good reference for that. Yeah, so both raw and homemade are kind of cool topics that we could talk about here as well throughout today. Raw diets aren't raw diets aren't raw diets. There's such a variety or spectrum out there. There are now commercially available raw diets, which many of those undergo a process called high pressure pasteurization to hopefully kill some of the pathogenic bacteria that may be on them. Not a fail safe, but it does in a sense make them maybe a little bit safer as a product that's being sold as a commercial product. The advantage to a commercial product is that it's going to be complete and balanced or it's going to have to follow those AFCO rules and regulations the same as any other pet food. Homemade raw formulations become a little bit more concerning because again, there's no homemade or there's no pasteurization of those products. There's no way to really balance them. People think that feeding just a whole foods kind of raw diet bones and all those things provide all of the nutrients need, but that's really not the case. Um, there are some board certified veterinary nutritionists out there that will formulate homemade raw formulas for your clients. So if that's something that they're really insisting or really want to do, I would strongly recommend reaching out to one of the nutritionists that will do a homemade raw formulation for them so that you can really ensure that at least the pet is getting complete and balanced nutrition. There is no advantage to feeding raw food. There's been no scientific study that has showed that it has any superiority when it comes to nutrient content or actual ability to provide nutrition for our pets. There's one study that shows that it might be a little bit more digestible for our pets, but nothing superior enough that really outweighs the risks of having raw foods in your home. But again, if that's something your client insists on, help them do it right and refer, and refer them to a board certified nutritionist that will formulate raw for them. Same thing with homemade diets. If they're not done correctly, they are unbalanced. And almost every recipe that's available just in a book or online is not nutritionally complete and balanced for our pets. So they really should have custom homemade recipes formulated. And again, most board certified veterinary nutritionists will do that because if it's a cooked product, you can really get most of them to formulate. Then there's a small subset of them that will do homemade raw formulations. So really looking back, if we just back up here, if you go to the American College of Veterinary Nutrition or acvn.org, that will list all of the board certified veterinary nutritionists in the country. They're a little bit few and far between. Um, we do have one here in the state of Minnesota at the University of Minnesota, and she will do homemade cooked formulations, but not homemade raw. 
but you can use that website as a resource to reach out to other veterinary nutritionists, again, if you're looking for that raw formulation. Thanks so much, Cassie. Uh, again, just a reminder, um, you guys have uh, sent in a lot of great questions and I uh, wish we had the time to answer all of them, but we will be again, typing up something um, that is all of our Q and A. And I think we will definitely do some links um, and providing a recorded um, copy of this presentation as well for you to be able to access. So again, check your email for that information. We'll get that email to you out. And um, again, we wanted to have this opportunity to thank Cassie for her time and sharing her wealth of knowledge of nutrition. Um, to all the attendees, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to learn with us.